Hello, this is the seventh video in the calculus section. Uh, it's going to be about integration methods. Uh, and so this is, these are methods of finding indefinite integrals. And so we're going to study the three methods I mentioned last time, or integration by parts, integration by substitution, and partial fractions. Um, this video is going to be a bit long. I might add up front, uh, but I'm going. I'll mark the timestamps of where I discuss each of the methods, and so you can feel free to uh, split it up and not watch it all at once. I'm going to go over uh, several examples of each of the techniques, and I anticipate it will go a bit longer than the, the other videos. So the first technique is called integration by parts, and integration by parts is the integral version of the product rule. And so since integration is the opposite of differentiation, there's a rule for integration that follows from the product rule for differentiation. And so in order to understand what integration by parts is, remember first what the product rule was. And so if you have two functions u and v, the derivative of u times v is u times v prime plus u prime times v. And so if you take an indefinite integral of both sides of this equality, you uh, get the following, that uh, u times v, maybe we should technically add a constant here, u times v plus a constant is the indefinite integral of u times v prime plus u prime times v. And if you subtract one of these terms, you can split this integral up. The integral of u times v prime is equal, plus u prime times v is equal to the integral of u times v prime dx plus the integral of u prime times v dx. You move one of those terms to the other side of the equation. So say subtract the one which is u prime times v over to the other side of the equation. Then what you get is this formula here. And this is the formula for integration by parts. Uh, we can think of it as being, we have an integral of a function u times the derivative, and then you can move the derivative over to the other function. So you have the derivative of v on the left side of this equation, and the derivative of u on the right side of the equation. So this formula allows you to calculate some indefinite integrals. And I'll do a few examples. As a first example, we'll do uh, this, uh, this function, x times cosine of x. So you want to calculate the indefinite integral, x times cosine of x the x. And so uh, let me, oh, we have the uh, integration by parts formula there. So we have to choose what's going to be u and what's going to be, be v. We have a product of two functions here, x and cosine of x. And uh, well, when we differentiate x, we get 1. And so that differentiating x will simplify the integrand. And so we want to differentiate x. So let's set x to be u which will be the part that's differentiated, and cosine of x will be v prime. So this is the integral of u times v prime, as shown in the left-hand side of this integration by parts formula. And so um, we need to figure out then what uh, u prime and v are. So we have u is equal to x. The derivative of u, u prime, is 1. The derivative of x is 1. And we said that uh, v prime was cosine of x, and so v can then be sine of x, since the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. So when we put all these in and use the integration by parts formula, we have that this uh, indefinite integral is equal to u times v, x sine of x, minus indefinite integral of v times u prime, so sine of x times 1, just sine of x. Right? And so then we just have to do this indefinite integral, and the integral of sine of x, the indefinite integral is negative cosine of x, and so you get x sine of x minus negative cosine of x and plus a constant when we do this indefinite integral. And so the integral of x times cosine of x is x 
sine of x plus cosine of x plus a constant. And this is how we can use integration by parts uh, in this example. Okay, uh, I'm going to go on to another example. Actually, it's using the same integrands, but uh, what I want to point out in this next example is that uh, we can also do definite integrals sort of more directly uh, than finding the antiderivative and then plugging in the limits using the integration by parts. And so in this example, we want to find a definite integral of the same function x cosine x between 0 and pi. Integrate. We want to find the definite integral 0 to pi x cosine of x dx. And so we've already found the indefinite integral. And so we can write this as uh, this indefinite integral. We don't have to include the constant because when you subtract the indefinite integral evaluated at the two endpoints, the constants cancel out. So we have x sine of x plus cosine of x uh, evaluated between the two endpoints. And I'm going to use this notation for when we evaluate definite integrals. I just point out what this notation is the first time we've used it. So you have this f of x, or general function, evaluated between two points, f, a, and b. Well, that's the what we know the definite integral is according to the fundamental theorem of calculus. So f of b minus f of a, just this notation. And so in this particular case, we have uh, x sine x plus cosine x evaluated at pi pi sine pi plus cosine of pi and this is the function f evaluated at b the upper limit uh, minus uh, the same thing evaluated at zero so when you plug in x equals zero you get zero for this first term and then you have minus cosine of zero so sine of pi is zero Cosine of pi is negative 1, cosine of 0 is negative 1, and so this is all together equals negative 2. Okay, so we then use the antiderivative we found uh, from the previous example in order to directly calculate the definite integral in this way. But what I want to point out is that you can also kind of combine the process, uh, and sometimes it's more convenient to do it that way. So do uh, the same problem a different way by uh, combining the process uh, of evaluating the antiderivative at the limits and doing the integration by parts. And so they say we have, uh, once again, the same problem, integral from 0 to pi x of cosine of x. The x. And, well, we use integration by parts as before. So let me just write the same thing, I'll do it a little bit more quickly. We're going to choose x to be u, cosine of x to be p prime. We then have uh, that u is x, u prime is 1, p prime cosine of x, and p sine of x. Okay, and so the Integration by parts tells us we have u times v here, so that's x sine of x, and we should evaluate that between the two limits in the definite integral, which are 0 and pi, and then minus integral from 0 to pi of u prime times v, which is sine of x dx. So, uh, the point here is that we can uh, kind of evaluate the limits as we go. And so, you evaluate this x sine x at pi and 0. When you evaluate at pi, sine of pi is 0, so you get 0. When you evaluate at 0, x is 0, so you get 0 as well. And then we have the, the second part, we have minus, 
and the indefinite integral of sine is negative cosine. And we evaluate from zero to pi between the two limits. Right, and so these two negatives cancel out. You have cosine of pi minus cosine of zero. Once again, that's minus one, minus one, or minus two. Okay, so this is this example demonstrating that you can either apply integration by parts to find the indefinite integral, or you can kind of evaluate the limits as you go in this way. All right, and I move on to another example of doing integration by parts. And so we'll once again do a, a definite integral, and I'll just evaluate the limits as I go in this one. And so here is the problem. I want to integrate natural log of x between 1 and e. The definite integral from 1 to e of natural log of x dx. And so this one uh, is not obviously written as a product of two functions. So it may be a little hard to see how you should apply integration by parts in order to do this one at first. But in fact, we can write this integrand natural log of x as 1 times natural log of x, and then it's a product of the function 1 and natural log of x. That's what we'll use. So integral from 1 to e of the function 1 times natural log of x, x. Okay, and so 1 will be the derivative, so 1 is going to be the v prime used in integration by parts, and uh, natural log of x will be u. Right, and so let's uh, do the same sort of table. We can work out u, u prime, and v. So u is natural log of x. u prime is the derivative of natural log of x, 1 over x. And then we said v prime equal to uh, 1. And so v can take to be x because the derivative of x is 1. Okay, so then let's use the integration by parts formula. And so we have first u times v. Let me write the entire integration by parts formula because it's not. So this is just the general formula. Uh, <clears throat> And then we'll plug in what we have for u and v. So u times v is uh, x natural log of x evaluated from 1 to e. And then this definite integral from 1 to e of 1 over x prime is 1 over x times v is x. So x over x dx. Of course, those x's cancel out, and that's the integral of 1 from 1 over e. And so we get, okay, so we plug in e. And, uh, so this x becomes e when we evaluate at the limit e. The natural log of e is 1. And so you have e. And minus, and you get when you plug in 1. The natural log of 1 is 0, so you get 0. All right, and then here we have the integral of the constant 1 from 1 to e. And so that's just going to be, to think of it as the area underneath the curve 1, it's constant. One and that, so that's just going to be the width of the interval from one to e, so e minus one, and so you have e minus e plus one. So this definite integral is equal to one. All right. So a second example using integration by parts. <coughs> so this was integration by parts, the first technique. Now I'm going to discuss the second technique, substitution. So whereas integration by parts uh, came from uh, the product rule, substitution comes from the chain rule, uh, different, the other rule we had for uh, calculating derivatives. And so I'm going to briefly discuss how it comes from the chain rule. And so let's suppose that we have an indefinite integral of a function of u, the variable u. And so this capital F of u is the indefinite integral up to a constant of 
lowercase f of a function u. And so that means that the derivative of capital F with respect to u is equal to lowercase f. Oh, now let's say lower, say u is a function of a different variable x, and let's apply the chain rule in calculating the derivative of capital F with respect to x. So this chain rule says that the derivative of capital F with respect to x is df du times du dx. And we already know df du is equal to lowercase f. So I substitute in lowercase f. So what we have is the derivative of capital F with respect to x is lowercase f times du dx. So if we integrate uh, this formula with respect to x now, so we find the antiderivative with respect to the variable x. Well, here we have the derivative of capital F with respect to x, and so finding the antiderivative of this, you just get capital F of u of x plus a constant equals the integral of this right-hand side here. And so, uh, well, this is the formula that we use when we apply substitution. And as a substitution refers to changing from an integral with respect to the variable x to an integral with respect to the variable u. And so just to summarize the actual conclusion from the previous slide, we say we want to integrate this function with respect to x, so this integrand of a function f of u of x times du dx. Uh, we can do that by substituting u for x, making this substitution, and integrating instead with respect to u. And a, a helpful way to remember how this works is to... Uh, write du for this part of the integrand here, du dx times dx. So du, we think of it as being du dx times dx. And so when we make the substitution, this f of u of x, just think of that as f of the variable u, and then this du dx times dx becomes the du. And use this, uh, this rule for changing from x to u in order to uh, cut, simplify the computations or when you're doing the computation. Okay, so this is how the technique works, substitution, the kind of the reverse chain rule. <coughs> and let's uh, do it in some examples. So here's the first example. I want to find the indefinite integral of 2x times sine of x squared. Integrate 2x times sine x squared dx. All right, so well, let the function f be sine, lowercase f, and u will be x squared. The u squared, and then remember that uh, du is du dx dx. And so in this case, the derivative of u with respect to x is 2x, so du is 2x dx. And here we have 2x dx. So maybe we can uh, rearrange this to make it more clear. Sine of x squared. So this part is uh, f of u of x, and in the previous slide, and then times 2x x, and this part is uh, du dx times dx. Referencing back to how it was in the previous slide. So when we make the substitution, we do the integral of f at u, which will be sine of u. Think of just substituting the x squared for u here, sine of u, and then this 2x dx becomes uh, du. Okay, and, of course, we know what the integral of sine is, with sine of u with respect to u. It is negative cosine of u. I want to add a constant. And then we'll put the uh, integral back in terms of x. So u is x squared. This is negative cosine of x squared plus and this is the indefinite integral using substitution. Okay, I'm gonna do uh, some more examples. This technique can be a bit confusing when you first see it. 
And so what you want to look for when you are doing these substitutions or to check if uh, uh, integrand uh, will benefit from doing a substitution is you want to see if there's one part that is the derivative of another part of the integrand. And so here we have another example. And what you can see here is that 3x squared is the derivative of 1 plus x cubed because the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. And so this 3x squared dx is going to be the uh, du dx and u is going to be 1 plus x cubed. So yeah, this is what you want to look for. One part of the integrand, which is the derivative of another part, and then you may be able to apply substitution in order to work out the integral. So let me do this example. <coughs> so we want to uh, now do a the integral of uh, 3x squared 1 plus x cubed dx. And so we're going to do substitution, and as I was explaining, we'll use u equals 1 plus cubed, then uh, du, remember, is du dx times x. It's going to be uh, the derivative of u with respect to x is 3x squared, so 3x squared dx. Yeah. Okay, so this, when we do the substitution, we have 1 over u, substitute in 1 plus x cubed for u, and then 3x squared dx is du. Okay, and we know the integral of 1 over u, the indefinite integral, since we know the derivative of natural log of modulus u is 1 over u. So natural log modulus u, derivative 1 over u. So this is uh, the indefinite integral, and we would want to add a constant. And then we plug back in uh, what u was, so 1 plus x cubed. Plus a constant. All right, so this is the indefinite integral. Uh, however, the exercise actually asked for a definite integral. So we were, wanted to find a definite integral of this function from 0 to 1. So let's do that by using the indefinite integral that we just found. So what we actually wanted to find was this definite integral from 0 to 1, 3x squared, or 1 plus x cubed x. We've just found the indefinite integral, natural log of 1 plus x cubed, so natural log of 1 cubed, and this should be evaluated from x equal 0 to x equal 1. And so you plug in 1 for x, you have natural log of 2 minus natural log of 1. Natural log of 1 is 0, so this is natural log of 2. That is the definite integral, the area between the x-axis and the graph of this function between 0 and 1. I, I, I do want to point out many people, when they do these types of uh, definite integrals with the substitution, uh, rather than finding the indefinite integral separately and then using that, as I've done, uh, you change the value of the limits when you do the substitution, and this technique can also work. And so I'm going to do the same example using that technique. So let's say we want to do this integral again. And we use the same substitution, so this part is the same, uh, but we want to change the limits. And so um, <clears throat> we can think of this as a, we had natural log of u, and we evaluated at u between 2 and 1, which are the values of u when x equals 0 or 1. So for example, at uh, x equals 0, which is the lower limit here, u 1 plus 0 cubed is 1. And at the upper limit, when x is equal to 1, u is 1 plus 1 cubed, which is 2. And so you can, in fact, change the limits as well as the integrand when you do the substitute. So we have the integral. 0 becomes 1. 1 becomes 2. And then when we did the substitution, it became uh, 1 over u du.
1 over 1 plus x cubed is the 1 over u, and then the 3x squared dx is the u. Okay, and then have this as the natural log of the modulus of u evaluated between 1, 2, and we just get the same thing as before. Natural log of 2 minus natural log of 1, which is natural log of 2. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> Okay, and so uh, this makes it, it streamlines the process a little bit rather than finding the indefinite integral. And in some really complicated examples, you might have to do substitution more than once or combine the integration by parts and substitution. And sometimes uh, when you're doing a definite integral, it simplifies things to change the limits as you go rather than having to find the indefinite integral and go back to the beginning again. All right, uh, so do one more example of a substitution, example of substitution, you find the indefinite integral of the tangent of x. So kind of like with the natural log, this one's a bit different where you may not immediately see that you can do a substitution, but uh, you can. So we want to find the integral, indefinite integral of tangent of x dx. And remember, tangent is the sine of x over the cosine of x. So indefinite integral of the sine of x over the cosine of x. And now you can recognize that sine is, well, the negative, the derivative of cosine. And so the substitution we want to do is u equals cosine so that the derivative of u with respect to x will give us this sine. So I do the substitution u equals cosine of x uh, then du will be the derivative of u with respect to x, which is negative sine of x dx. And so, well, we have sine of x here rather than negative sine of x, so we, we need to introduce a negative 1 times negative 1 to make it negative sine of x. The integral of negative negative sine of x cosine of x x and then negative sine of x times dx is u and the 1 over cosine of x is 1 over u so this becomes negative <laughs> integral of 1 over u du and well the integral of 1 over u as we already did in another example is a natural log of the modulus of u plus a constant, and so negative uh, natural log of the modulus of cosine x, putting back in uh, the value for u or the function, which is u. cosine of x plus b. So the integral of tangent is negative natural log of modulus cosine of x plus a constant. Okay, so these uh, are some examples using substitution. I, I, the final technique that I is going to uh, cover is partial fractions. And so partial fractions is really a technique for simplifying or really maybe expanding rational functions. So a rational function is a function which is a ratio of two polynomials. So uh, we have a polynomial divided by another polynomial. Uh, this is what we have here. Two is a, just a zero order polynomial, very simple. And we divide it by another polynomial. And partial fractions is a technique that allows you to expand this into individual terms where you can integrate each term individually. So let's look at how to do it in this example. And we want to integrate two over x squared minus four x plus and in partial fractions what you need to do is you need to first in the first step simplify the rational function so that you have a higher degree polynomial in the denominator than in the numerator and in this case we already have a second degree polynomial in the denominator and a zero degree polynomial in the numerator so that step is already done we don't have to worry about it the next step is to factor the denominator and so let's uh, take this integrand out and we're just going to 
work with the integrand first and we'll put it back and do the integral at the end. So we factor the denominator. And when you factor this x squared minus 4x plus 3, you get x minus 3 times x minus 1. And now what partial fractions says, kind of the part you need to remember, is that when you have uh, this type of uh, <clears throat> rational function where the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, you can split this up into a sum of terms where you have a constant divided by each of the factors in the denominator. So a constant divided by x minus 3, the first this constant will be a, plus a constant b divided by x minus 1. And you have more factors than you need more terms here. Okay, and what you need to determine then is a and b. And you can determine a and b by plugging in different values of x. And really, the simplest way to do it, in most cases, is to multiply through by each of the factors in the denominator and then plug in the zero of that factor. And so, for example, what this consider this factor, x minus 3. Let's say we take x to 3. We multiply through by the x minus 3. So if you multiply uh, this through by x minus 3, you have 2 over x minus 1 equals a this will cancel out when you multiply through by x minus 3, plus b times x minus 3 divided by x minus 1. And then if you plug in x equals 3, you get a equals 2 divided by 2. Or 1. Okay. Uh, then, so this determines a. You do the same thing for b, so you could determine b by letting x become 1, is the 0 of the, the other factor. And I can write out the formula where we multiply through by x minus 1, but I'm just going to say we cover up the x minus 1 factors here and here. When we multiply through by x minus 1, this term will become 0 when we set x equal 1, and so we just get b equals 2 over 1 minus 3. Uh, that's negative one. All right, so this is the partial fractions expansion. Now we've determined what a and b are. And so this is the simplification that allows us to do the integral. So let's first just write out the result from partial fractions. We have, what we're determined is that two over x squared minus four x plus three equal to one, a was one, one over x minus 3 plus minus 1, b is minus 1, over x minus 1. And so now when we do this integral, and just integrate each of these terms separately, and we can recognize those the integrals of those terms as natural logs. So integrating. get the integral 2 over x squared minus 4x plus 3dx is equal to the integral of 1 over x minus 3 minus 1 over x minus 1 dx. All right, and then you can integrate each of these terms separately. The integral of 1 over x minus 3 is natural log of the modulus of x minus 3. Integral of 1 over x minus 1 to be modulus is minus the natural log of modulus x minus 1. And we should add in this constant. Uh, to finish this up, you can use a, the property of natural logs that allows you to combine these two natural logs together. It says that this is natural log of the modulus of x minus 3 divided by x minus 1 plus a constant. And this is the integration, or the integral. So to summarize the technique as we uh, would first have simplified so that we had a rational function where the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. And we factor the denominator and write an expansion. Uh, 
where we have constants divided by each of the factors. Once we've done that, you can plug the partial fractions expansion into the integration or the integral and integrate each term separately. Okay, so this is one example of applying partial fractions. I'm going to do one more example with partial fractions. Okay, uh, and so once again, in this example, we have a rational function. Remember, I said several times that the first step in partial fractions is that you have to simplify in order to get the degree of the numerator less than the degree of the denominator. And notice in this case, we have the degree of the numerator is two, the second degree polynomial. The degree of the denominator is also two. And so you have to do a step of simplification first before you split up the uh, rational function. So do that. So I'm going to try to integrate this 2x squared over x squared minus 1. So the general technique to, to do this initial simplification is to do polynomial long division. But in this case, it's fairly simple. You can see you, you need to cancel out this x squared minus 1. So let's write this as 2 times x squared minus 1. So we've subtracted one there, but then we need to add something to make up for the fact we've subtracted one, and it's two times one, so we need to add two in order to make this equal to the numerator. So two x squared is two times x squared minus one plus two. Divide by x squared minus one. And the point of doing this is that now you can split it into two terms, and in one term the x squared minus ones will cancel out. So you get two times x squared minus 1 divided by x squared minus 1, the first term there, uh, plus 2 divided by x squared minus 1. And the x squared minus 1 cancel out here. Get 2 plus 2 over x squared minus 1. And now this term is a rational function where the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. And you can move on to the next step of partial fractions with that one. So let's do that. So let's take this term, 2 over x squared minus 1. And the next step then is to factor the denominator of this. Take uh, 2 over x plus 1 times x minus 1. And the Partial fractions tells us that we will be able to write this as an expansion with constant divided by x plus 1 plus some other constant b divided by x minus 1. Now use the same kind of technique, multiplying through by either of the factors, setting uh, x equal to the 0 corresponding to that factor in order to figure out what a and b are. So first, uh, the factor x plus 1 we get 0 when x is negative 1. If we multiply through by x plus 1 and set x equal to negative 1, this term will become 0, and we'll just get a is equal to 2 divided by negative 1 minus 1. Which is negative 1. And uh, again, find b by setting x to be the factor of the 0 of the factor corresponding to b, so setting x equal to 1 in this case. And so when we do that, we get that b equals 2 divided by 1 plus 1, or 1. OK, and so we have uh, that this 2 divided by x squared minus 1 equals negative 1 divided by x plus 1 plus 1 divided by x minus 1. So I'm going to use that here. 2 minus 1 over x plus 1. That's this term. Plus 1 over x minus 1. This term. OK, and so this is the full partial fractions expansion that we wanted. And now you can use that in order to calculate the integral. So we wanted to find the integral 2x squared divided by x squared minus 1. 
Using the technique of partial fractions, we found that 2x squared divided by x squared minus 1 is equal to, found here, the uh, integral of 2 minus 1 over x plus 1 plus 1 over x minus 1. So we get uh, the integral of 2 is 2x. Integral of 1 over x minus 1 is natural log of modulus of x plus 1. Integral of term is plus natural log of modulus of x minus 1. Let's not forget the plus constant. And once again, as in the previous example, you can combine these natural log terms. Get 2x plus natural log of x minus 1 over x plus 1 plus a constant. Okay, so this is another example using partial fraction. And uh, this will be the end of the, the video on the techniques of integration. In the final video in this section, we're going to introduce a new concept uh, called Macaulay brackets. That'll be the next video.